Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ISHLT ID Professional Community Webinar. We're so excited to have you all here. For those who may not be familiar with the structure of ISHLT, there are 10 professional communities which serve as a gathering place for professional specialties that make up the care teams of for our patients. Each ISHLT professional community is represented on the four ISHLT interdisciplinary steering committees, advanced heart failure and transplantation, advanced lung failure and transplantation, mechanical circulatory support, and pulmonary vascular disease. The ISHLT professional community webinars are free and open to all those who are interested. If you're not a member of ISHLT, we hope you consider joining this unique international society. If you're already a member, thank you for making this organization what it is. If you'd like to join or get more involved with ISHLT, you can contact anyone at ISHLT headquarters through our, the website. And we hope to see you at the ISHLT annual meeting in Denver, uh, April 19th through the 22nd. Hi, everyone. Uh, the ISHLT professional community is pleased to sponsor us today's webinar titled The Future is Now, the Use of Hepatitis B Virus and HIV Positive Donors for Thoracic Transplant in conjunction with the Transplant Infectious Disease Section of the Transplantation Society. The mission of the TID Section of TTS is to promote research and education in the prevention, diagnosis, clinical consequences, and management of infectious diseases encountered by the transplant recipient. We welcome you to join this organization and information regarding membership in the TID section of TTS may be found on our website. My name is Marcelo Radicic. I am the head of infectious diseases at the Instituto de Trasplante y Alta Complejidad in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I am joined in moderating this webinar by Rebecca Kumar, assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Georgetown University. We ask that if you have any questions for our speakers, that you enter them into the chat box. And after both presentations, we'll open up discussion with our presenters. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Cameron Wolf. Dr. Wolf is an associate professor of medicine and infectious diseases division at Duke University. He's a former chair of the Disease Transmission Advisory Committee. And his main research interests are in the clinical space, helping to find new ways to safely expand organ donation, especially for patients and donors with HIV or viral hepatitis, or more recently, COVID. COVID. Uh, Dr. Wolf maintains a practice in both transplant infectious diseases and HIV, as well as doing research focused on respiratory viruses in the immunocompromised. Today, he will be discussing challenges and opportunities for the use of hepatitis B virus positive donors and thoracic transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Come, welcome. Marcello, thank you. And thank you, Stephanie, also for the introduction. Um, if I could just get a quick thumbs up that people can both hear me and see my screen, that'd be great. Okay, great. We can see you and hear you all. Fantastic. Hey, uh, firstly, thanks to both organizations for letting me uh, present here. This this is a real honor, and I and I I hope I do a, a complicated thing justice in twenty minutes. Um, I have done some DSMB and advisory board work during COVID, none of which I think is related to this talk, uh, as best I can tell. So, I, you know, we don't we don't actually typically have presentations on hepatitis B as much as we perhaps should, particularly not on a North American or European audience. So I figured we'd actually start by reviewing a little bit of basic virology and then to get into sort of why I think um, this is therefore a transplantable virus. Um, you know, hepatitis B affects approximately, we think around 300 million people um, across the United, across the globe. And you can see here from the color map on the right, it's very predominant uh, into East Asia, and parts of sub-Saharan Africa in particular, um, with, you know, as, as many of you would remember, um, significant implications to maternal fetal transmission. It's vaccine preventable these days, but really can cause chronic lifelong problems leading to cirrhosis and liver damage, and often actually has been in many other countries outside of North America, a reason for 
um, ultimately leading liver transplantation. It's a preventable illness, and I think we should talk about it within that context. If you take a more central view to where many of us in this call uh, would practice, um, you know, hepatitis B has been steady, actually, in terms of new incident cases across the United States. If you look at that table to the left, I'd be cautious of reading too much into the apparent dip in 2020, as I think this was largely, as so many illnesses we found um, related to COVID and our loss of the sort of the tracking of epidemiologic variables. So we're sitting at about an addition of 20,000 estimated acute cases across the country um, per year. Again, with a geography in the United States that, ref that, is, that is disparate and probably reflects um, immigration patterns, health economics, and, and, and many sort of contextual factors which are beyond the course of this talk here, but, but worth at least thinking about where you, where you live within that context. I'm gonna very quickly with a single slide reference hepatitis D, hepatitis B's uh, sort of long lost brother. Um, for those of you that don't sort of think about this all the time, remember that this is a replication incomplete virus. It needs the presence of hep B for hepatitis D to survive and to replicate and to cause more accelerated cirrhosis and infectivity. And so really just keep in the back of your mind, everything that I wanna talk about today in regards to hep B, I think you should assume that if you're dealing with someone where that's a known factor that we've also looked for, although likely excluded, hepatitis D as a co-infection. And I won't uh, go into that more. I do think it's worthwhile contextualizing this though in regards to what we may come into in the future. And that's that this is a, an illness that's very prone to swings in prevalence based on our immigration patterns. This is a clearly US centric slide, but I think the same could be applied to an Australasian context or perhaps a European context, which reflects immigration patterns. This is an illness that is unfortunately still occurring with new incident cases across the globe that will be reflected in your travel patterns. And so we should think about that when we think about donors. I want to talk a little bit about virology because this also impacts our sort of management decisions and the way we've thought about our protocol here that I'll end with towards the end of this talk. You know, in contrast to hepatitis C in particular, where I think many of us on the call probably feel more comfortable um, with its transplant implications, there's two big differences here with hep B. The first, this is in, in, in many ways a functionally incurable condition because of the way it can incorporate its own DNA into a circular contained um, DNA sphere, a CCC DNA contained within the nucleus, such that if even if someone has been able to immunologically achieve a cure with a surface antibody production clearance of virus, it remains in the hepatocyte prone for future activation. Similarly, its location of where it is incorporated into our, into our um, genome is such that it leaves it prone to corticosteroid activation. So many of the difficulties I'll describe later in terms of transplantation with hep B are related to the fact that it's an immunosuppressive enhancing illness. And we've probably all run into that situation either with steroids, with CD20 inhibitors, other forms of immunosuppression that allow hep B activation. So it is a different virus in, in many contexts. Bit of quick revision on serology for those of you that are not into the weeds of it all the time, be it a, a, a recipient or a donor. Um, obviously surface antibody for us is the idea. We want someone to have mounted either through vaccine case one or natural immunity case two, a defensive antibody that re reduces the replication capacity of this virus and does so effectively. Um, a core antibody positive alone will, will, will say that someone's naturally immune. These are not the donors that I'm going to be talking about. I want to get into donors that are both surface antigen positive and or NAT positive. So viremic donors or at least antigenomic donors. Um, and where we would anticipate historically that transmission into any organ, particularly liver, but really any organ we'll talk about, is, is, is probable, if not you know, considered likely. The cases that I'll just briefly wash over are those tricky ones where you see someone who's core antibody positive and nothing else. And, and these require a little bit of extra assistance with, frankly, as they're, usually they're either a false positive or perhaps a, a, a cleared individual. Um, who's lost their surface antibody. Um, these, these are the ones I don't want to mention today. Phil. But our issue historically, at least, has been that 
whenever donors or in fact recipients uh, who carry active hepatitis B have been taken to transplant, we recognized that many years ago, we were, ran into risks of de novo acute hepatitis or reactivation hepatitis with the potential for secondary transmissions and ultimately graft losses. And I'm gonna describe a couple of cases of those here in, in some papers. But historically, this had largely led to a sort of many decisions on national boards to say that like patients in group three or group four on this screen should largely be only offered to either recipients who are also active for hep B or, or in dire situation need of transplant only. And even then with great caution, I'm gonna try and counter that argument by the end of today. So the first reason for optimism is that we are in, in the same way perhaps that we were in for hep C five years ago, um, a, a drug plentiful space. And I can see this is a you know, US context slide here for sure, but I, I think many of us will be in the same space where we now not only have historical therapies such as antibodies like um, HB, um, but we also have a number of strong active direct acting antivirals which are highly effective in hepatitis B space and safe in a transplant space in particular. So tenofovir in both its forms and tecovir and actually what you no longer see on this slide, this is taken from our treatment algorithm, here are our old drugs of lamivudine and emtricitabine, which are kind of backed off now as second-line therapy, slight reduction in efficacy, which we can get into if people want to. But I want to leave you at least here with the, the seeded thought of good, well-tolerated, negligible drug interaction medications to keep hep B under control, albeit not clear it. So if we've got a potentially dangerous virus, and I'm going to tell you it's not curable to get that CC DNA out of the way, why the heck would we want to think about it? I think this requires a little bit of a sort of phase shift that I, ho I hope many of you have sort of thought about within your own programs. And the first is, like on some level, our patients don't reach to our level to be uh, transplant listed until they have an absolute real and measurable on the wait list to mortality. And I think many of us sometimes get trapped into thinking that when taking a risk of an extra infection, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about giving someone hepatitis B, um, we forget that there's a counterbalance to that. The counterbalance is, I don't know how long it's going to take you to get another organ. And so Mike Mulverhill, now uh, one of our senior thoracic fellows, in fact, looked at this specifically in lung transplant a couple of years ago to say, look, the more sick the person is on the wait list, the more urgently they need to say yes to an organ. And if it comes with a higher concern, such as Hep B, Hep C, COVID, um, that that may be a mortality win for you if you consider against their wait list risk. So in fact, you can stratify that. You can say, look, hey, if I'm in a high LAS risk score, this person needs an organ, um, maybe this is something you're going to consider. We certainly do this actively at Duke, as I'll get into, for people with high LAS scores. We would consent them willing to take Hep B organs. Some people take the other flip-flop, I don't think it's wrong, is to say, like, what if you're stuck in that kind of low LAS, you're probably going to struggle to get an organ, but you've got real morbidity due to your illness. Uh, maybe this is a step that you're willing to take that extra level of concern and risk. Or in fact, some programs do what they have done with their hep C drugs, I think, recently, and said, look, if you're sick enough to be on our lung transplant or heart transplant program anyway, maybe you're sick enough when this decision um, becomes something we should buy into particularly if you have, say, a difficult PRA or size mismatch or some other reason why this is going to be complicated. So let's talk about actual outcome data. And I'm going to disappoint a lot of you by saying so far there's not a lot. So I'm going to build by talking a lot from my liver and abdominal colleagues, and I'm going to walk through um, up until some current thoracic literature. So the first is I think we need to be comfortable with the idea that if our recipient carries hepatitis B or our donor is a core antibody positive donor, that we feel very comfortable about moving forward in both of those situations. So if I go to some Chinese data where, again, think back to the endemicity of hep B, this is a much more common debate for them. In fact, graph survival, if you as the, don as the recipient, sorry, are swift antigen positive is very comparable. So we know hepatitis B in these contexts can be controlled. These, these recipients should be moved for if need be. Um, the same is said in a different cohort of, of, of kidney transplant recipients where some of their living 
re recipients of living transplants, in fact, did totally fine if they were Hep B surface antigen positive. You might look at their recipient viremia and think, well, hang on, 21% versus 10 seems a bit rough, but there were differences in the way that they were given antivirals often more sporadically than what we would do here that may account for some of that. But at the end of the day, graph performance at a three-year point of view looked fine. We can also extend that into a thoracic space. So if you've got a hepatitis B positive recipient moving through your program, you should feel comfortable to let them progress. So this was a UNOS data set collected now a couple of years ago that looked at a couple of hundred hearts and lungs, a few, a small number of heart-lung combinations, um, where in fact survival for um, those who were getting thoracic transplant on the heart or the lung side, in fact, was really pretty comparable whether or not the hepatitis was there or not, provided it was controlled. So let's start with that as the first basis. Our recipients should be fine to move forward provided that we've had a look at their liver and made sure that they're not cirrhotic coming into the, to the discussion. So what about mismatches though? And this is really where I wanna sort of prod a few people uh, a little bit. So I'm gonna start with some liver literature because I think logically that was the first place where this um, expanded in the United States at least. And this is some data from uh, a Cincinnati group who have really taken this ball by the horns. They began pre-pandemic with publishing some early information on NAT positive donors into negative recipients um, who in fact, for the most part did fine for the first couple of years. And this was sort of their early foray into what became in fact a much larger trial in liver and kidney patients, looking at, as you can see here, a cohort of 826 at their center some 89, if I do the math, who received NAT positive abdominal viscera as mismatched uh, cases. They were all given in Tecavir, so direct acting antivirals from the day of the transplant fourth, and they all received upfront um, immunoglobulin, HBIG. And at least the kidneys were only given there in Tecavir for a year. The livers were treated for life with the expectation that they had a, an ongoing risk because of that circular DNA. And in fact, I think you would could argue if you look at their outcomes uh, that this suppression effort uh, was quite effective with only two livers becoming transiently viremic and resuppressed. The important endpoints I think are on this slide. So from graft survival or patient survival, depending on whether you're looking at kidneys on the top or livers on the bottom, um, small numbers, but pretty comparable kaplan meier survival curves. And from a wait list benefit point of view, we're still at that nice little infliction point where we perhaps were about seven or eight years ago for hepatitis C donation, where in fact, they would argue that they gained significant waitlist advantage for their recipients um, by, by, by offering them organs in this class and moving forward. So they would say an outcome which is comparable, um, but a waitlist that's much, that's much shorter. So if I move forward a little bit further and go back to our OPTN data and look at lung transplant specifically, so let's move into the thoracic space. I'm going to say from the outset that this is very limited data so far. So um, Sarah Belger and Karen Doucette up in, up in uh, Canada uh, looked at this when they in fact had a patient who was a 63-year-old with rapidly progressing IPF, who they had a, a well-matched donor, low-level uh, viremia, surface antigen positive, and said, look, we, we, we think this is comparable. We should go ahead under appropriate consent. And in fact, did very similar approach to what the Cincinnati group did. HBIG up front for a week and Tecavir for life. And at least at publication, which was at an 18 month point, uh, negative viremia in the recipient and a good FEV1 outcome for what they anticipated. We had done the same. I notice uh, one of my old fellows who's now at Emory, at Emory Emily Eichenberger's on the line here, um, shared a patient who back in 2019, 2018, I think it was, rapidly progressing IPF again, difficult to match individual otherwise from a size point of view and the pace, the urgency of his LIS was increasing. And his first offer was also a highly viremic individual who with HBIG and ongoing in Tecavir, at least at the two year mark has done well. Uh, and I need to update this slide to give you this three-year data. But again, suffice to say, um, controlled individual. What's worth noting here, if you, if you cut to the middle of the table, 
on recipient serologies, we have individually felt much more comfortable doing this in people who have a quantifiably high surface antibody as their recipient. And in fact, I think we could argue in this individual, we don't know if he's been infected at all, although we've not wanted to take away his entecovir, as his core antibody has remained uh, negative post-transplant. Emily actually went on a little bit further. Um, this was a 2020 ISHLT abstract and sort of looked to say, well, hang on, like what evidence do we have that these organs are even out there in, under UNOS evidence? And there is some to say that, look, we are as a community using, in, at least in the United States, a reasonable number of hep B NAT positive organs. Now, some of these will be going to NAT positive recipients, but at least in terms of a potential organ offer that you may sign up to, um, it's a smaller pool than hep C for sure, but it's not zero. Are there evidence uh, elsewhere of individuals also taking this? Well, again, I think if we reflect back to Asia, the answer is yes. So six donors out of this Korean group who were surface antibody positive, surface antigen, sorry, positive, heading into negative um, recipients. Um, and all six have done well to their documentation um, with follow-up days here that you can see quite extensive. Small cohort, and I don't know their liver function, but at least on the surface of it, quite a pleasing outcome. For their heart recipients who were positive, a word of caution, that they did have three of their recipients actually really struggle with fulminant reactivation. And yet I would put to you that there's lessons here also as to how we can do this better. The first case, someone who in fact did not begin on antivirals out of the gate, and in fact waited until they became viremic and was unsuppressible in the efforts afterwards, I think cementing concerns that antivirals should be started up front. The second person here um, financially ran into some trouble with maintaining their antivirals and became viremic. And the third person, in fact, had a very unusual but documented lamivudine resistance mutation, um, which is also worth just keeping as a little red flag in the back of your mind. So not a zero cost to this process. If I want to think about cost, um, I think, you know, all of our bean counters in our divisions will want to think about this more acutely. I, don't, I, I couldn't find a cost analysis for this in thoracic space, but I could find one in liver. So I present you a little bit of what, how they are thinking about this. This is again, that same group out of Cincinnati who would have said that for them on a liver, depending on the urgency, depending on the MELD score in that liver patient, um, your quality adjusted life years falls under a threshold of $50,000 a year, which is typically in US terms, what most insurers or payers will say, hey, that's a threshold you have to reach before something is, uh, is, is considered reasonable. I would argue in a thoracic space where um, the potential need for lifelong antivirals may not be there, we in fact may end up in a quality, quality benefit that's uh, even better than this. I'm gonna start winding home with a couple of quick comments. I, I wish I could find you pediatric data to talk about, but I can't. Um, I can find certainly some cases where the use of hep B core antibody donors similar to adults has been done fine. This is just a more sparse area. And, and frankly, the weighed up issue of leaving a child with or a teenager with a lifelong virus may become more impactful. I don't know of a reason, and maybe Tina will go into it in the next talk, why co-infection can't be thought about under the same breath. Most of my HIV patients who I bring through transplant, in fact, are already on active hep B active drugs and vaccinated, in which case this we absolutely sign them onto this program as, as reasonable. I think you can make a strong ethical argument. We do this for so many other infections, both curable ones and suppressible ones at this point, that in the interest of patient autonomy and beneficence, I don't think this is a fundamental problem. But it does require us to have conversations with our OPO community, procurement groups. They do not currently recognize in many instances that this is something that we are interested in. And I think you also need a frank discussion with the infectivity of what you're doing for patients. Final slide is, well, so what are we actually doing here? This is Duke example. I'm not gonna present this as gold standard, but it's what we're doing. We individually consent everyone for this um, if to be, to be a recipient. I don't think it's standard of care yet unlike hep C. 
Um, we have a combined program that protocolized this through transplant hepatology and transplant ID, and we all see the patients when they come through. We track them based both on their need for vaccination up front, based on what their surface antibody titer is. Remembering these days, we actually have some modified adjuvanted hep B vaccines that help us stimulate defense. And we give HBIG and either TAF, tenofovir, or as an alternative, entacovir if need be, and track them Q3 monthly. I'll leave you final slide. Uh, like, I think this is what patients understand. Like, if I'm faced with a question, and some of you may recognize that's an HIV drug, which is a lead in to maybe Tina's slide or my other thought about mismatching HIV situations. But if I'm posed with a question to a patient of, do you want to take this VAD? Um, or we have a heart here that looks like a great heart, but it's going to mean you need to take antivirals. If that was CMV, we would do it in a heartbeat, excuse the pun. So I would put it to you that we now are in a position where we should be thinking about that much more generalizably for hep B. And with that, I will probably hand it across. So you know, yeah. but we are yeah. perhaps moving straight to you, I think. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, for your excellent presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tina Soser, who will be addressing HIV positive donors and thoracic transplant. Dr. Soser is a professor of medicine and surgery in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Organ Transplantation at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. She obtained her medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine and completed her residency in internal medicine and fellowship in infectious diseases and clinical microbiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. In 1998, Dr. Stoser joined the faculty at Northwestern. Her clinical and research interests relate to infection outcomes in organ transplant recipients and HIV medicine. She is currently serving as the interim director of the Transplant Infectious Disease Program and the site clinical director for the Max Wise Combination Cohort Study. She has been the Northwestern site investigator for key NIH-sponsored multicenter trials of HIV and transplantation, including the HOPE in Action trials. Welcome, Dr. Stoser. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, thank you to the societies for um, allowing me to discuss this topic. Um, it is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And it, you know, in, in 20 minutes, you cannot do justice. The, the you know, three decades of, of work that has, has gone into this but recognize that this issue and journey began for an international community of patients with HIV at the dawn of the AIDS epidemic in 1984 and um, through advances in HIV care um, and improved survival. And then the recognition of a growing burden of end organ diseases, including cardiovascular and lung disease, um, which is why people are increasingly seeking therapies, advanced therapies for, um, for heart and lung disease. Um, so with that, these are my disclosures. And I'm gonna begin with the first reported experience um, um, where in South Africa, where Dr. Mueller led a team of um, transplant specialist who started performing HIV positive to HIV positive or HIV D positive R positive transplant, kidney transplants. And this paper is, it was actually, she first reported a series of 10 patients in 2010. So while we were toiling in the United States in our multi-center um, study of HIV and kidney and liver transplantation, she was busy um, saving lives um, with this procedure and then reported out updated outcomes in 2019. So in 2019, they reported uh, 51 HIV D positive to R positive kidney transplants and one with uh, reported one in five year graft survival of, um, of, of 96 and 79% and also excellent patient survivals 87 and 84%. Um, they then looked at a subset of patients um, in, this, um, in this cohort and looked at pairs of um, recipients and the donors that they received. And so they did proviral DNA sequencing 
in their recipients uh, and um, matched that to, uh, and, and then analyzed it um, and compared those to viral sequences in the donors um, to look for evidence of super infection. And out of the pairs that they studied, they found maybe one, one instance of, of probable super infection. And, and thought that this represented um, just subclinical, a transient subclinical infection, you know, probably from ling lingering uh, viral shedding. And, um, and I could tell you that in the, in, so far in the HOPE studies, what has been studied, we have not seen any evidence of donors um, super infection, measurable donor super infection um, in people who are maintained on HIV therapy. So um, the next large study, and again, I'm presenting a lot of kidney and liver data because this is where the body of evidence is in HIV and organ transplantation. Um, and I think it demonstrates some very important principles on HIV outcomes and even some of the transplant outcomes and things that we should be watching for. So in the Hope in Action Kidney Pilot Study, this is, uh, was reported a couple of years ago in AJT. And it was a, a study of 75 uh, transplant recipients, 25 of whom were true um, donor positive recipient positive for HIV, and then um, 15 um, HIV um, D minus R positive recipients. And it was a majority male African American um, um, Part, um, subject pool, um, you know, based on our, 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 our epidemiology of renal failure in the United States. And so large um, um, primary causes of renal failure were predominantly hypertension and high van in, um, and um, their baseline CD4, their baseline um, viral load had to be um, suppressed um, to be enrolled in the trial. So everybody was suppressed and the baseline CD4 counts were high, all above 500. It's interesting that most patients by this time were on integrase-based, um, integrase inhibitor-based art therapy, which was really a remarkable advance, I think, for both HIV care, but especially for transplantation, because in the original HIV um, kidney transplant studies, the multicenter study, about 40% of people were on protease inhibitor therapy, and it was a very complicated um, Pharma, um, pharmacokinetic interactions and a lot of difficult management after transplant. And so this was just an advance in a, in, in, within a couple of years. So they followed patients. This was short-term follow-up. Um, the D positive, R positive group was 1.4 years and the um, D minus R, R positive group was um, 1.8 years. Uh, patient survivals were excellent, 100% in both groups and then graft survival, 92% and 90%. But importantly, there were you know, rejection rates were high, and that was observed in the original HIV multicenter um, study of, of kidney transplants with people with HIV. Um, but it, importantly, in this study, there was no difference in the one-year patient or graft survival between um, um, D positive and D minus um, recipients, and. Um, there was um, there were no cases of HIV breakthrough or differences of breakthrough and no sustained breakthrough, and then um, no differences in hospitalization for infection or opportunistic infection. They did note this trend toward higher one-year rejection rates um, in, in persons who received organs from donors with HIV compared to donors without HIV. So it's just an area for further study, and we're looking forward to more data in the full study that's being analyzed now. Um, similarly, a liver pilot study was conducted, smaller numbers. It's been slower to accrue in the first the pilot study and then the and then the full liver study in the United States. I think mostly because of the availability of DAAs for hepatitis C, and so a lot of the need for liver transplant has not. It's not gone, but the hepatitis C burden um, isn't there. So they, these were 45 recipients, uh, 24 of which received organs from donors with HIV and 21 from donors without HIV. And one year survival um, in the um, group who received um, HIV positive organs was 83.3% uh, versus 100%. And it near, um, um, it was you know uh, significant and there were a lot of malignancies. So there were a lot of infections in the D positive R positive group, but you know, more than that, there were malignancies. So it's definitely an area to watch as, as people get you know, age with HIV, 
and you have this convergence of the multimorbidity of HIV and the risk for malignancies in HIV, and then the risk for malignancy in, in after transplant. And then to take a further look at um, what our donors look like in the United States. So these are hope donors through the, the pilot and, and the full studies that, uh, 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 from March of 2016 to March of 2020. And 92 donors were allocated through the um, HOPE. 58 um, were donors with HIV and 34 were false positive, were donors with false positive HIV testing. And in the United States, these organs, the false positives are allocated through HOPE. Um, all in all, 177 organs were allocated, including 131 kidney and 46 liver. And imagine what, you know, what that might be like if, um, um, the, you know, the laws had allowed, you know, transplantation of, of HIV positive organs into, into um, other th um, organ groups like pancreas, um, heart, and, and, um, and lung. So the HOPE donors increased, it was a slow start in 2016 and 2017, but then um, the country hit its stride and we started seeing a lot more um, utilization of hope donors and, and, and um, in the country. So 40% of the donors, when you look at these donors, 40% of them um, were, had positive NAT um, testing at the, at, at the time of the donation. So 70% uh, of the donors. Uh, prior knowledge of the HIV existed in 70% of them and uh, about a quarter of the um, donors the HIV just became known at their the, the um, hospitalization um, for you know be, before um, donation. And if you look down to antiretroviral therapy use, about uh, sixty four percent of patients uh, the donors were on therapy, reported to be on therapy at the at, you know, at the time of their um, their donation. And uh, median CD four count was one ninety four, um, and half were below two hundred. Uh, median viral load at donation was 882 copies, and almost a half of them were un had undetectable HIV. So to look at tropism, 68% um, were R5, so use, utilizing CCR5 as a co-receptor for entry into um, cells, and 32% uh, were dual R5, X4, but there were no X4 um, tropic donors. And then a little bit further look at the drug resistance mutation. So they looked at all the viremic donors um, to date at, at the time that they, they, they reported this and they did genotypic um, um, resistance testing. And resistance mutations were actually quite high, probably higher than what we expected um, from looking at sort of national studies um, and rates of antiretroviral um, resistance mutations in, in Western countries. So um, major drug resistance mutations were detected in almost half, including NNRTI uh, uh, resistance mutations. Uh, a minority of patients had in integrase inhibitor uh, mutations and 13% of, of, of person, uh, the donors had a multi-class. But um, remember, there really have not been any breakthroughs or super infections. So I think it's a testament to our updated therapies in HIV, you know, namely the newer, um, um, newer um, NNRTIs like, you know, tenofovir and the integrase inhibitors and the newer NNRTIs. And so if you look at this sort of sea of drug resistance mutations, the ones that are very common are the M184, which would make, you know, that which leads to limivudine and, and, and tricytabine resistance and things like the K103N, which leads to the older NNRTI resistance, um, like such as an efavirenz and nefarapine drugs we don't use anymore. So kind of an interesting look. I wanted to include a slide just on the pra practical aspects of how to evaluate a donor um, with HIV when you're considering them um, for one of your um, transplant candidates. It really, um, it, it's really just a lot of detective work, but I've always been impressed at how much information, if you put a little bit of effort, how much information you can um, receive about donors, especially if the diagnosis is known. And so if the, if the it was a pre-existing diagnosis of HIV, 
it's very easy to obtain the name and contact information for the primary HIV provider um, through the, you know, from the OPO. And those providers are normally, you know, more than happy and, and um, to speak with you in a timely manner, pull out charts, go through records to make sure that you have all the information you have. And at the same time, they're in shock that they're losing one of their own patients, but they can provide a lot of important insights and social insights. And so you can get information about what their therapies have been. Um, have they been on, um, you know, have they required medications like sulfa to indicate that they've, you know, been at risk for opportunistic infections or have a diagnosis of AIDS? You can get their last labs and, and if they've had any prior resistance testing. For donors with a new diagnosis, it's a little bit uh, more of a guessing game, I think, and uh, using some um, um, Judge clinical judgment. Um, I always recommend to the team to get um, to obtain extra blood for viral load and resistance um, genotyping in house. And then it's it's if there are not CD4 counts available, lymphocyte counts can and absolute lymphocyte counts can give you a kind of a rough idea of their of their immune status. And then for all donors with HIV, you know, regardless of the you know the, if their diagnosis was known or not. Um, it's important to screen for any active infections or infection concerns and, and, and make sure that you're looking into things like cryptococcal you know, meningitis and getting a cryptococcal antigen if there are fe unexplained fevers. And viral hepatitis testing results are also very important. Again, I think Cam you know, just, you know, talked a lot about this in his talk, but if you have um, patients who are on hepatitis B active therapy and often HIV therapies serve that dual purpose. And the, with the availability of DAAs that don't rely on an intact immune system um, for efficacy, I think that it is um, an important to consider, continue to consider these um, donors with co-infection. And then for transplant candidates, what I like to do, and it's it, it's not a you know an official recommendation, but for a lot of transplant candidates, they are often highly antiretroviral therapy experienced, and it is difficult um, in some cases to get copies of prior resistance testing. Um, and so, if patients, if you don't have those testing results available, or if there are incomplete. Uh, if they have incomplete adherence, I always try to get um, proviral resistance DNA testing so that you have some idea of, of their, their, you know, what antiretrovirals that would be active so that if you need to make changes based on the donor's HIV um, resistance profile, then you can do that much more easily with less guesswork. So moving on to what, um, what is going on in heart and lung transplantation. Um, these are the recent trends in heart transplantation uh, for persons with HIV in the United States. And obviously we're um, a lot further behind than with the volume that has been performed for kidney and liver transplantation. So this was um, uh, an SRTR data that um, Dr. Pereira um, shared with me and he actually recently presented this um, in a, um, a, a, a conference that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, but there were 114 donors um, uh, or recipients with HIV in the United States between 2005 and mid 2022. And these transplants occurred at 57 centers. And so most transplants only occurred, most centers only had one to two transplants. And there was only one center with five transplants and one center with 14 transplants. And so not a lot of volume at any given center. Um, and that has implications for what our regulatory sort of boundaries are right now. Seven, and then there were seven combined heart kidney transplants and one heart liver. There are a couple of um, studies in heart transplant um, and their out and outcomes in persons with HIV. One was an international uh, multi-center study that was retrospective and it was conducted um, from 2006, 2000 to 2016. And um, they reported 21 heart recipients with HIV uh, with well-controlled HIV. And uh, most patients had non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as their underlying heart condition and reason for transplant. Uh, a minority of patients received induction. 
And outcomes uh, at one year were 90%, but then fell off kind of like, you know, kind of reminiscent of the kidney transplant outcomes and rejection rates were, were high in this, um, in this cohort and two patients developed allograft vasculopathy and uh, high, high, again, high infection um, rates in this, um, mostly bacterial in, in this population. So not opportunistic infections per se, but a high burden of infections. And then there was another study from the United States, and this was a retrospective analysis of OPTN data, and it included 41 heart transplant um, recipients with HIV you know, spread across 24 centers. And then they matched these 41 recipients to another um, 41 um, uh, transplant recipients with underlying um, dilated cardiomyopathy without HIV. And just notably 54% of the, um, the recipients in this cohort had a bridge, um, had a VAT as a bridge to transplant prior to, uh, uh, prior to the study. And then outcomes, the one in year, five year survivals were actually better than what was reported in the prior study, 85.9% and 77.3. And there was no difference in survival between the um, uh, recipients of HIV positive organs uh, or uh, recipients of that were HIV um, sero positive and um, the sero negative OPTN controls. And there was also no difference in survival between those who received, uh, who had VADs before transplant and those who, who did, were not bridged with VADs. And their estimates of, their um, Kaplan-Meier estimates of, of vasculopathy and malignancy were similar um, uh, between the uh, recipients with and without HIV. In lung transplant data, the date, you know, it, 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 the numbers are even less. So in the United States, 55 um, um, recipients with HIV have received lung transplants from 2004 to 2021 um, in the SRTR. And, and to date, there have been no HIV D positive R positive lung transplants. So, but you'll notice that, you know, over the past, you know, five, six years, um, the, you know, the, um, the numbers seem to be picking up and, and there seems to be a growing need or an awareness of, of patients with HIV uh, in need of lung transplants. This is a study, the same study that looked at the heart transplant outcomes. Um, um, the international study also looked at lung transplant outcomes and they identified seven recipients. Um, with HIV um, and mostly for underlying interstitial lung disease um, and, and COPD was in one cystic fibrosis, uh, about half the patients received an induction agent. Uh, outcomes were, I, I think, not really all that, you know, different from, you know, the general lung transplant population, but uh, 28% had um, acute cellular rejection, one um, developed loss, um, 80, 86% had a, a one-year infection uh, rate, um, all maintained HIV suppression, and the overall patient survivals were 86% at one year and then 75% at five years. And then most recently, there's a European multi-center retrospective study, and it was a survey of transplant centers across Europe from 2007 to 2021, and they reported the outcomes of 21, 22 lung recipients with HIV Again, um, all with um, seronegative donors with a median follow-up of 25 months. And there was no protease inhibitor use in, this, um, in, in, in these patients. Uh, the um, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension was the, you know, the leading underlying cause of lung disease in these patients. And then there was a smatter of smattering of other underlying lung diseases. Um, again, about you know, a, a minority, less than a, about a third of patients receive some induction agent. Again, they all maintain their HIV suppression. And then their outcomes in terms of rejection and infection rates seem pretty on par with what we see in the general, in the general lung transplant population with survival of 79% you know, at one year, three year, and five years. The early deaths that happened in this in this study in these um, recipients were from shock and primary graft dysfunction, and then a couple of infections. So in the U.S., we've had um, you know regulatory barriers that have um, that have um, you know gotten in the way, I think, of us you know being able to explore the use of donors with HIV um, in in you know for heart and lung transplantation. 
So in the beginning, the HOPE Act variants, the first final, you know, the final um, safeguards limited the utilization of organs from donors with HIV to kidney and liver transplantation only, um, just because that's where most of the data existed. And then the HOPE final safeguards include this experience criteria um, of the transplant team, which most people, which most centers cannot, um, cannot meet those criteria. So in May of 2020, but there have been a little bit of um, a little bit of movement with the regulatory barriers. In May of 2020, the Hope Act variance was modified to allow additional organs to be transplanted from donors with HIV into candidates with HIV. Um, but the research criteria and safeguards, including that transplant team experience, remained in place. So these are the transplant. So, you know, among the final safeguards, the act, the safeguards and the research criteria, there is these transplant center criteria. And, you know, I wanted to focus on for the purposes of this talk, the experience with, with HIV to HIV positive transplantation. So in order to be able to pursue donors with HIV, you had to have sufficient experience with HIV negative to positive organ transplantation and not just a kind of a collective experience across transplant programs, but the specific surgeon you know, by organ group, the surgeon, the transplant physician, and um, HIV physician um, must have experience with at least five HIV negative to positive transplants over a four-year period. Um, and, um, and then IRB approved research protocols and also um, an independent advocate to, to, um, to meet with candidates to discuss the potential risks of pursuing HIV, donors with HIV. So as of the end of last year, these were the centers and I, uh, that were approved for kidney and liver transplant. But if you notice, there are only two centers in, in New York that, that uh, are approved uh, for, for a heart transplant, and there were none for lung at, um, you know, at the end of the year. And so this really, you know, hope organs in general, because of the, the research criteria, there aren't a lot of centers who have been able to provide that, um, you know, provide um, this care for patients. And so there are large gaps across the country where patients just can't access um, this care. And then when you look at heart and lung center, it's even, it's, it's even less. So at the end, of, in the middle of November, um, the HHS Advisory Committee on Blood and Tissue Safety Availability um, met with transplant experts across um, um, the U.S. to review accumulated experience in HIV D positive R positive organ transplantation, and including um, heart and lung transplantation experience. And they considered proposed changes to the safeguards and research criteria. And they ultimately voted to remove the statutory NIH research criteria and IRB for kidney and liver transplantations. And so if this is approved by the HHS secretary, um, kidney and liver um, transplantation, um, HIV will basically be treated like hepatitis C and there are no longer going to be research restrictions. Um, and, and it can be done as part of standard of care. And then importantly for, the, um, for other organs, they further voted to um, um, remove the NIH research criteria requirement for other organ groups like pancreas, lung, and heart. Um, but they are going, they are also calling for the OPM to develop and implement new, implement new special policies for organ specific variants for each organ. So again, it's going to, you know, it, it, it's still, we're still have to apply, the center will still have to apply for the, um, to, uh, for the variants. And organ-specific candidate criteria and transplant programs requirements analogous to the research criteria um, um, will have to be developed for the safety to look at patient safety and outcomes in transplants other than kidneys and liver. So basically, it removes and, and it, it will remove and you know or modify the experience criteria a center needs to move forward with heart and lung transplantation. But there is going to be some sort of research. Uh, criteria in place. And so these organ transplants won't be able to happen unless you are able to uh, um, do it under a research setting. And then, um, and then they're also asked for and voted for organ specific um, OBTN outcomes to monitor, again, the IRB 
And so they also um, recommended that when multiple organs are transplanted, the default approach will be to use the guidelines of the organ with the more conservative policies. So if you're doing a combined heart liver, it will revert to the heart policy. So there has been one reported, this is the only one that I'm aware of, uh, one reported Hope um, Heart Kidney in the United States, um, and it was reported um, last year um, with a successful short-term outcome. So moving ahead, there's a, you know, a large body of research under the HOPE uh, final rule that has demonstrated excellent graft in patient survivals um, and, and in HIV to HIV kidney and liver transplantation, and uh, more importantly, no um, increase in HIV-related complications in, as far as opportunistic infections and HIV superinfection. In thoracic organ transplantation for persons with HIV, the preliminary outcomes have been satisfactory and good, really comparable to um, what we are seeing in kidney and liver transplantation. And so, and importantly, the HIV outcomes have been good. And so HIV related, there's no reason to expect that HIV related outcomes will differ in, um, from um, those reported in liver and kidney transplantation. Um, if um, the if the HOPE Act final rule and notably the center experience criteria are modified, it should, and if it's ultimately signed by the HHS secretary, it will allow more centers maybe to proceed with HOPE um, thoracic transplantation. And it should increase access of these advanced heart and lung disease therapies um, and transplantation for patients who are in need. And it hopefully will provide more incentive for OPOs to pursue donors with HIV if they believe that the US transplant centers will utilize you know, more organs from these donors. And so I think it's gonna be, you know, our, our next challenges are identifying people with heart failure and lung disease in need of advanced care and getting them to that care. We know there's a growing burden of disease, of heart and lung disease in this population. Um, and, but they need improved access to therapies. Um, and we need to raise awareness for organ donation um, by persons with HIV. Um, it's always an interesting conversation with a patient when they realize that they can be an organ donor. It, is, it, it eliminates stigma and a lot of the, what we have done over the past couple of decades with advancing transplantation and for people that need it has been a lot about removing stigma in the medical community um, and um, and in patients and but really to to eliminate this stigma of um, uh, is is huge for patients. Um, this will also increase the donor pool. And then I think we still need to you know wrap our minds around what kind of studies need to be done for the thoracic organ specific outcomes and how are we going to accomplish that recognizing that there's probably not going to be a lot of funding that comes our way to do that. And really, you know, internationally, you know, what can we do to combine forces to get this done? And then looking at the longer outcomes, uh, again, there's a high burden of comorbid condition in aging persons with HIV, and it happens earlier um, in their lives. And so it converges with the multimorbidity of, of the post-transplant patient. And so I think we really need to be aggressive about treating, screening and treating for these conditions to improve the longer term outcomes. And then I'm just gonna throw it out there, but you know, if you only had to take a pill a day to prevent HIV, you know, are there certain patient populations um, with heart and and, you know, with that, that, that have end stage organ disease that would be willing to accept organs from donors with HIV. And, 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 and will we get to that point? And so with that, I'm going to end. Well, thank you, Dr. Stosser. That's been an awesome talk, awesome talk indeed. Um, we have a very little time for questions and answer sessions. Um, and as they are not going to, to be present in, the, in the, uh, the, 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 those that were made on the chat will not be uh, available to those who listen to this in YouTube later. Uh, I will read at least one question for come um, from 
Eric Belshuren, I, I hope I, 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 I pronounced this well, who asked, what would be the problem stopping entecavir at one year and see if someone becomes HBB NAT positive and then brain state, brain state entecavir is necessary? Cam? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it was a great question, Eric. Um, look, I, th I think we, we debated that with our lung patient uh, a lot at the one year mark. And I think if you were going to do that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would only do it in someone who was not a liver. I think you, you know, you, you, you much more fraught in a liver transplant or a multivisceral. But I think he, we, we, we thought about doing it because our person was highly surface antibody positive, never developed a core antibody and was non-biremic the entire way through. Um, I don't see a problem with it, provided that you are very certain that you had close follow-up with your recipient in terms of being able to continue probably, Margaret Hannah and I are chatting here separately, maybe a Q3 month cadence of viral load checks. Because the, 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 the kinetics here are so much slower than they are for hep C, whereas if you wait a week, you've suddenly got 100,000 viral copies. Here it takes months. My, my pause with that are a couple of those Korean cases where, you know, clearly one person became viremic early post-transplant and in fact was not resuppressible, although at that time it was with a defavir and lamivudine, so maybe not quite the drugs that we would use today. But I think if you were prepared to counsel your patient to say, look, hey, we've really got to stick accurately with this, I, I think it's possible. But it's it's with some caveats for sure, because at the end of the day, staying on those antivirals is is very well tolerated. Thank you. No, I was just going to say, I often have the question raised to my HIV negative patients when they hear I do HIV positive transplant through hope, who, who universally have almost said like, hey, if this is the way for me to get an organ, I'll sign up to take one of those cases if it involves taking a pill a day. And I always joke with my fellows that I would do that in a heartbeat if that was, like, I, 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 again, I think it speaks to the safety of those meds that we now talk about. Clearly, we have a legal framework that does not permit that currently, but it's it's not it's not for medical reasons. Sorry, I cut people off. Um, so our our next question is for Dr. Stoser. Um, for your patients who are on two drug regimens like dolutegravir, here, rilpivirine, um, who get offered an organ via you know a HIV positive donor, what is your typical management for these patients? I think, you know, I was low because I, I grew up in a, you know, in the HIV environment where it was three drugs, you know, there was like that way or, you know, no way at all. And so for a long time, I would, you know, even add a, a, a third drug. But I think that, you know, therefore the, for the recipient, there's such durable suppression with two drug regimens. And if you have, you know, and, and these, you know, especially something like dalutegravir and rilpivirine, I think the resistance, the rates of resistance are, 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 are low. And so I think it's fairly safe as long as you have, you know, um, you're, you're going to be getting donor information soon. I, I will say I've done a living donor pair um, who are a couple who, <laughs> who I actually had to make a change post-transplant, a married couple. And I had to make a change because when I got resistance testing back, one of them, you know, the, the, the donor had, you know, more resistance than I expected. And so I had to make changes to both of their regimens. So I think if you have the data to two drug regimens are fine, but you, you know, so I'm a big, a big fan of having, you know, resistance testing for both to be safe. Well, it's 3.03, so um, we just wanted to thank um, Dr. Stoser, Dr. Wolf um, for speaking uh, today. Thank you to everyone who joined us for the webinar, and we'd like to thank our sponsoring organizations, ISHLT and the TID section of TTS. And we hope that you consider joining these organizations if you're not already a member. And um, we also hope to see you at the ISHLT meeting in Denver uh, this April. So, bye. <laughs>